Bible and turn to Luke 2. Luke 2. Today's message is entitled, The Presence of the Holy Spirit. And we're studying Luke chapter 2, verses 22 through 35 today. And we're going to look at the life of Simeon. Luke 2, beginning in verse 22. When the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord. The pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem and his name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents then brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and he blessed God. And he said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation. You have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed him and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed. And a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that the thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. Praise the Lord. Some people have an extraordinary capacity to wait for a significant life-changing situation. Jack and Gladys Tips of Seymour, Texas, they learned how to wait. Their story was told several years ago in Texas, and uh, they had a son, and his name was Gene. Gene was a college student, and he had re returned home from attending a rodeo, and when his car slipped on the road, there was an accident, and he was injured, and then he went into an impenetrable coma for 30 days. Finally, he awakened from that coma in a semi-conscious stupor, and he continued in that state for eight long years. All the professionals told Jack and his wife that Gene would never be any better. They didn't know what to do, and so they, they continued to exercise and feed and talk to Gene, and after eight years, he had to have a routine medical operation, and 65 hours after the operation, he sat up in his bed, wide awake, alert, and he was questioning for the first time in eight years, and he was saying, I've got to get back to college. It was like his life was just placed on hold for eight years. Nobody could believe it. And nobody can still explain it. Suddenly, he was awake, he was alive, he was alert, and he's resumed his life. Pretty incredible, huh? Jack and Gladys Tips were so elated that they waited for expectancy for that day. There are some of you in here today, and you're waiting for a life-changing event. And the reason we're looking at the life of Simeon today is because he shared with the Tips family and with some of you the ability to wait with a sense of expectancy. These folks believed that God was going to intervene in their lives in a decisive way. And Christmas is a time where we wait. Trust me, I have kids and they are waiting and not very patiently for Christmas. <laughs> Today is Christmas Eve, 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 or something like that. So my children told me this morning. <clears throat> Waiting with expectancy. We need to wait ex with expectancy. God's going to do something in our lives. See, Simeon's life was prolonged waiting. But he had a white heat of in 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 intensity and anticipation that God was going to intervene in his life before he died. And as every page of the calendar turned, or every... Uh, shadow of the hourglass passed. Simeon said, God is about to intervene in my life in a decisive way. And I recognize that 
Simeon belongs to one of the minor characters of the Christmas story. And you might think, well, the Sunday before Christmas, we ought to be hearing about one of the major leaguers, like Joseph or Mary. But even though uh, Simeon belongs to the cast of minor characters, he teaches us how to wait with expectancy for what God could do in your life and mine this Christmas. And Simeon reveals the character, the conduct, the heart, and the mind that waits with preparation for the coming of Christmas. And those who wait for Christmas do so with a certain character, and he reveals that. Most of the people in both Jerusalem and in Judea, they missed that first Christmas. Those who were the somebodies really didn't even know what was happening, and those who were the nobodies were at the center of it. The powerful people were oblivious that the greatest event in history was taking place under their very nose. And you got to think about how interesting it is that God does that that way. The people of the political establishment had no idea what was happening. Those who had no political or religious power were the only ones who were able to recognize what was happening at that moment. Simeon was an unknown, anonymous, older man in Jerusalem, yet he belonged to those who could recognize what God was doing at that Christmas time. If you're taking notes this morning, point number one is this. Be a person of character this Christmas. Be a person of character this Christmas. Would you look with me at Simeon's character for some clues about how to be prepared for Christmas this week? When you look at Simeon's character, you find, firstly, that we ought to wait for Christmas with integrity. Integrity, that's subpoint A. Luke 2.25, it says, There was a man in Jerusalem, and his name was Simeon. This man was, listen, there are two words right in the middle of verse 25. Simeon was righteous, and it says he was devout. Do you see that? As he was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. The emphasis does not rest on who he was, because he was an unknown man. The, the emphasis was on what he was. He was a man who waited for God with integrity, righteousness, and devotion. Uh, the word righteous means someone who was exact, precise, lawful, upright, uh, waiting for God to do something in his life, basically. Now, it's interesting how often you see this word used with the cast of characters in the Christmas story. You see it when you look at the very first page of Luke's gospel with the coming of the message to Elizabeth and Zechariah. They were the parents of John the Baptist. And Luke 1, 6 talks about that. It says they were both righteous before God as they were walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. Uh, blameless were those who experienced that first Christmas. And when I read of Simeon here in the Bible, or when we read about uh, Elizabeth or Zechariah, uh, it reminds me of the words of Proverbs 4.18, where it says, The path of the righteous is like the light of dawn, which shines brighter and brighter until full day. The, the hearts of Mary and Joseph were clear before dawn. Matthew 1.19, it says, Her husband Joseph, being a just man, and unwilling to put her to shame, he resolved to divorce her quietly. You see, Joseph was a man who was precise, exact. He was upright in his walk. Now, I want us all to wait with an integrity of heart this Christmas season. Can I remind you, God doesn't suspend the, the rules this Christmas season. Those with impure eyes don't see Christmas with clarity like those of us living for the Lord. Those with stained hearts cannot experience what God wants to do at Christmas. God doesn't play the game by a different set of rules just because you're busier. And I really want to encourage you to think about how now is a great time, as great of a time as any, to have some self-examination. And think of Psalm 139, 23 and 24, which says, Search me, O God, know my heart, try me, know my thoughts. And God, see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. I want you to pray through that psalm this Christmas season. You see, Simeon, he was ready for Christmas in the exact same way as Zechariah and Elizabeth, the same way as Joseph. 
all of their hearts really seem to be ready for Christmas. Christmas is a time when you need to examine your heart and see if there are any grudges, see if there's any bitterness, any unforgiveness, see if there's anything that's causing you to fall short of the Lord Jesus Christ, anything that's causing him to not be first in your life. There's something on my desk in my study, and uh, it's, it's just got a list of questions to prepare your heart for God. And I, I intend to really prepare for Christmas this coming Wednesday to prepare my heart so that when Wednesday morning comes, I will be ready to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ because I'm, I'm standing before God seeking to live a life of integrity. And, and I know that Simeon was living a life of integrity. Let's learn from that. Let's also learn the character of those who wait for Christmas with intensity, intensity. There was not only integrity, there was also intensity. That's sub point B. Luke 2.25, in, in that verse again, it says, there was a man in Jerusalem, his name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout. We just looked at that. And then look at the next part. Waiting for the consolation of Israel. Waiting for the consolation of Israel. Everything that we read about the first century, it's one of darkness, despair, and depression for the people of God, specifically in Israel. They were a subjugated nation. Keep in mind, these people had been uh, conquered by the Roman general Pompey in 63 BC. And it appeared that the sun had set, the music would be in the minor key forever. But there was at least one person in Jerusalem who lived on the edge of expectancy. And he thought, God is about to intervene in my life in a redeeming way. And Simeon lived out the truth of Isaiah 41, which says, comfort, comfort my people, says the Lord God. And God gave him great comfort. See, consequently, Simeon, he was a really old dude, all right? Uh, we read historically that he was probably about 113 years when this took place. So he was an old man, and he was living for the Lord. He was living with wisdom. And I think it's amazing how we can learn from people who are older than us uh, within the Bible. And if you are an older person, just remember that God can use you mightily this Christmas season. All right? Can that encourage you today? Do you move into this season, everyone in here, do you move into this season expecting God to do something in your life? Are you expecting more than just buying a bunch of stuff on Amazon or, uh, or, or having big credit card bills in a few weeks? Do you expect more than that? Do you expect that this very week God might break into your life in a very way that you hadn't previously anticipated? The very message of Christmas is to stand with Simeon with expectant energy that God could this very week break into my life in a way that he never has before. See, I've been a pastor for nearly 12 years, and I've learned this. You're going to have just as much of God as you expect to have. Every person I've ever pastored, they, they have just as much of the, the power of God in their life as they really even expect. If, if you expect to have a mediocre, mediocre ex experience with God, then you're probably going to have that. If you have a routine experience with God, your experience with God will probably be routine. If you expect a, a dull and insip insipid relationship with God, that's what your relationship with God is probably going to be. But if you have an anticipation that the Holy Spirit may move within your life, I'm just telling you guys, it's more likely to happen. Beg God to do something afresh and anew in your life. I have covenanted with God this week that to, to not only examine the integrity of my heart as I wait for Christmas, but to look at the intensity of my heart. And I confess and I covenant with you that I expect God to break into Jeremy Roberts' life in a new way this week. And I hope you have that expectancy too. Simeon also waited with an inspiration. An inspiration. The most significant and decisive thing about Simeon is that he sustained an unusual relationship with the Holy Spirit. And this is really the key portion 
of our Luke 2 text today. And I want you to look at the very end of verse 25, Luke 2, 25, the very end of the verse. It says, the Holy Spirit was upon him, was upon Simeon. Now, you might say, well, so what? The Holy Spirit's on every Christian. Well, let's keep in mind, this was not yet the Christian era, all right? The Holy Spirit at this time was coming selectively upon individuals who were aware of and open to his influence. So this old man, Simeon, 113 years old, he sustained an unusual communion with the Holy Spirit of God. In the Christian time of focusing on Christmas is a time for us to focus on the renewal of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Keep in mind, the Holy Spirit was silent for multiple centuries between the Testaments. And then he came upon uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth and Mary at the conception of the Lord Jesus. There was a movement of the Holy Spirit, uh, when, particularly when Mary broke out into song and she said, my soul magnifies the Lord. There was a renewal of activity of the Holy Spirit. And that took place in two ways. Pay attention now. There was a specific revelation about his life and gave, it, it gave definite direction. If you are seeking a fresh movement of the Holy Spirit in your life, you need to pay very, very close attention to this portion of the sermon, all right? One thing that you can see is that the Holy Spirit can give specific revelation into your life. You can find that in verse 26 here. That verse says, It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit. He would not see death until he had seen the Lord's Christ. Now you might just wonder, well, how did God reveal that to him? It says at the beginning of verse 26, it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit. I kind of wonder how that took place, don't you? What happened? Maybe there was a meditation on Scripture and a passage leaped up out of the pages. That would have been cool. He thought, okay, I'm not going to die until the Messiah comes. Maybe it was in a vision, I don't know. A vision by day and a dream by night, maybe. Maybe there was an audible voice of God that just spoke to him. And that voice said, Simeon, you're going to live until the Messiah comes. I have no idea. But what I do know is that the Holy Spirit gave him some specific revelation according to Luke 2.26. And I believe that the Holy Spirit reveals stuff to me all the time. I read the Bible and I just think of stuff. Sometimes I'm praying and I just think of stuff. And I want to say something that's a true burden on my heart. I want you to, I want you to hear me. I'm a Baptist. I've been a Baptist since I rested in my mother's womb, all right? I know Baptists. My academic and vocational background has all been in the Baptist church. But hear me. The Baptist church has drifted further and further from mentioning the Holy Spirit. I believe the Holy Spirit is quenched in too many Baptist churches. And we almost think we have to be stoic to be spiritual, and we have to just uh, not talk about it too much because we'll be weird. I want, you to, I want to encourage you to ask the Holy Spirit to speak into your life, and I want to encourage you to enjoy the Lord, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does indeed give specific revelation according to Luke 2.26. He reveals things to us. Secondly, we know the Holy Spirit gives definite direction. He gives definite direction. Look at verse 27. He came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law. The Holy Spirit desires to give you consistent personal revelation of the will of God for your life. We are only playing with these stories and making them religious fairy tales if we leave them a half a world away and 20 centuries ago. The meaning of Christmas is that that same Holy Spirit who came to Simeon is the one who will reveal to us personally and precisely what the word and will of God is for our lives. But not only that, to give us the same kind of direction, I, I want you to think that just as the Spirit moves Simeon from his home to the outer court of the temple, it's the will of the Spirit of God in your life this week to draw closer to the presence of the Lord. That's what he was doing to Simeon. That's what he's doing to you. 
He wants to draw you closer to the presence of God. Would you be open to that revelation, that direction, which always comes from the Holy Spirit, to lead your, you closer to the presence of God? Live a life of integrity and intensity, and you're going to be more likely to be in the presence of God. Here's something that's really interesting. And you think about our U.S. history. I, I've been reading a lot about Florida history since I moved here. And that's led me to read about all kinds of American history. I'm on a little rabbit trail with that right now. <laughs> and I learned that in the Massachusetts Bay Colony in colonial America, the rigid and, rigor, and the, the rigid and rigorous Puritans, they actually outlawed Christmas for a brief season. From 1659 until 1681, for 22 years, Christmas was illegal in Massachusetts. Did you know that? There was no feast or festivity. No frolicking, no joy, no white elephant presents, nothing like that. <laughs> no ornaments. It was illegal for 22 years to celebrate Christmas. Now, we don't belong to a place where there's any law against celebrating Christmas. But my point to you is that you do experience it and that you do so with integrity and with intensity and with inspiration that ought to belong to the character of those who want to have the full experience of Christmas. So we also need to know, secondly, hope you're taking notes, to be a comforting person this Christmas. We're not only looking at being a person of character this Christmas, we're also looking at being a comforting person this Christmas. Don't you want to be a person who comforts others? Don't you want to be that kind of a person? In this passage, we find the kind of comfort that ought to belong to those who are waiting for the Lord to arrive. And there's some comfort that comes from knowledge of the Lord and reception of the Lord. There's comfort that comes from a personal satisfaction in the Lord Jesus. Uh, there is just great comfort in reception of the Lord. And that's subpoint A, reception of the Lord. See, Simeon literally became the first person on record to receive the Lord Jesus Christ. And he was moved by the Spirit to go into the temple courts. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took Jesus into his arms and he praised God. It was an awesome moment. See, here was this old man who on a, on a day he was suddenly propelled by the Holy Spirit to leave his home to go to the outer court of the temple in Jerusalem and to receive the Lord Jesus. See, at that same time, Joseph and Mary were moved by that same spirit to, to bring baby Jesus to the steps of the outer court and to present him at the temple. So there in that temple was an intersection between Simeon and the holy family, as I would call them. Now, religious art notwithstanding, there was no halo over the head of baby Jesus, all right? There was no aura around Mary and Joseph. In fact, scholars tell us that there would have been dozens or scores of uh, young parents bringing babies on that same errand to present their children at the temple. But in some mysterious way, unerringly, this aged Simeon was guided to exactly the right place at exactly the right time to receive the Lord Jesus. And then Mary was willing to surrender baby Jesus into the hands of this unknown old person that would stand there and receive Jesus. Now, do you recognize that this is simply a symbol of what the Holy Spirit of God has been doing in, in your life and my life and every other person's life and Christendom? You've been part of a rendezvous with God that was arranged by the Holy Spirit. And what began that day mysteriously on the steps of the temple in Jerusalem has continued every day since then in Christian history. Isn't that awesome? You see to the book of Acts, there was an Ethiopian who was returning to his country in Acts 8, right there in the middle of the desert. And then suddenly, one of the seven deacons of the early church was led by the Holy Spirit to be joined to him right there. See, at that moment, there was an intersection 
where that Ethiopian met the Spirit of God in a rendezvous with the Lord Jesus Christ. It was the same in Acts chapter 10, two chapters later, where Peter was in his house, and Cornelius, the Roman centurion, was in his house. And by the movement of the Holy Spirit of God, the two of them are brought together with a rendezvous that was led by the Holy Spirit. It was the same in Acts chapter 16, when that traveling single adult businesswoman, Lydia, she was down by Philippi, and she was moved by that same Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul was also there, and at that time there was a rendezvous with Paul and Lydia and the Holy Spirit. And the mystery of the message of Christ is that Sunday by Sunday we meet right here at Thomasville Road Baptist Church, and that same Holy Spirit that led to a rendezvous between Simeon and the Holy Family is the same Holy Spirit who meets with us in this very room. Every time we gather in the house of God, it could lead someone to an intersection of life with the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that an awesome thought? It's one thing to read about that in the life of Simeon. It's another thing to experience it personally. And the very central question of this Christmas time is whether or not you yourself have ever had that same kind of intersection of life with the Lord of Christmas. And just as Simeon was impelled, guided, directed by the Holy Spirit to a specific place and time when he literally received the Holy Spirit and cradles him in the crook of his arm. Can you look back to a time in your life where you literally actually received the Holy Spirit of the living God in and through the, the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you ever had that happen? Let's not only look at reception of the Lord Jesus, but also satisfaction from the Lord Jesus. See, the comfort of Christmas is in that reception of Christ, but it's also in the satisfaction of life that comes from that reception. And I suppose there's no sentence in the Word of God that speaks more beautifully of satisfaction than do the words of Simeon. In this little speech that Simeon makes in Luke 2, 29 through 32, it's been given a name in Christian history. And let me, let me say that again so you grasp it very clearly in verses 29 through 32. This little speech given in 29 through 32, it has a specific name in Christian history. And that name is Nunc Dimittis. That's your Latin lesson of the day. Nunc Dimittis. It comes from the first two words in the Latin version. It's been set apart as one of the beautiful statements of faith. The Magnificat. And it's a statement of restrained ecstasy. And what Simeon's doing here in verses 29 through 32 is he's expressing satisfaction in life, having received the infant Savior. And he said in verse 29, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. So beautiful. Simeon came to a point where the, many of us have never reached. He said, I have experienced the ultimate and personal well-being. I've reached the ultimate and personal satisfaction. I have reached the climax of purpose in my life. And he was basically thinking, God, you can now take me now because I have total satisfaction. And we would be wise to listen to someone who has lived over a century. And at the end of that over a century of life, they finally expressed pure satisfaction and he was able to say my eyes have seen the salvation of God isn't that beautiful I hope that this Christmas more than any other Christmas will be a Christmas of satisfaction because you could receive Jesus Christ and then after you receive Christ you could say with Simeon I have found that ultimate sense of well-being and satisfaction that comes from the Lord Jesus Christ is there anything else that characterizes this as we wait? We are to be people of, of character who are driven by integrity, intensity, and inspiration of the Holy Spirit. We also need the comfort that comes from receiving Christ and the satisfaction of that. And the third and last point in this morning's message is this. Be a concerned person this Christmas. Be a concerned person this Christmas. Now, there are two concerns that are often characterized as we wait for Christmas. 
One is certainty of God's faithfulness. Certainty of God's faithfulness. Now, Simeon was able to proclaim this brief word, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, my eyes have seen your salvation more than any other event in biblical history. And Christmas screams out the message that we serve a God who is able and willing to keep his promises. God keeps his promises. I reviewed this week 73 promises from the Old Testament that were kept in the first advent of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the Old Testament, it closes with at least 73 promises hanging in the air, having not yet been fulfilled. Think of Genesis 3.15. The first promise that was given uh, in, was in Genesis 3.15, where in the Garden of Eden, God promised that first pair that he was going to call them to crush the head of the serpent. Think about Nehemiah 9-7, where it was renewed with Abraham and Ur of Chaldees 4,000 years ago, and God told that old man, through you, all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. That's a promise. In Deuteronomy 18, God renews his promise to Moses when he says, I'm going to send another one like you, Moses. Think about Psalm 2-7 when God continued in this song and he promised that he was going to send his glorious son one day. Think about Psalm 22 where he gave details of the crucifixion of Christ in a promise. Psalm 118-22, he promised that the Lord would come as a cornerstone. Even though being rejected by men, he would be a cornerstone for the Lord. Job 19, Job receives a promise from God that there would be a mediator, one who would stand between God and man. Think about Hosea. Hosea was given a promise that there would be one man who would be a second Moses, a second David. He would begin a second Israel. Think about the prophecy of Isaiah to which we turn at Christmas. And it is replete with the promises of God. Isaiah 7, we're promised that the great Redeemer would come born of a virgin. Isaiah 9, we're promised that he would be the wonderful counselor. Isaiah 11, we're told that uh, out of the dead stump of the family of David, the, uh, that a shoot of light would come. Isaiah 40, 49, 50, 52, we're promised that a suffering servant would eventually be born, and he, he was going to be able to fulfill the deepest needs of our lives. Malachi 3, we're told that a messenger would come, the son of righteousness would come. And in the whole of the Old Testament, God screams out with dominance, saying, I promise, I promise I'm going to intervene in humanity. Now, what does Christmas mean to all of us? It means, it means to us more than anything else that God is not only able, but he's willing to keep his, his promise. I don't know about you, I have, I have a gift of life that is everlasting because I've received Jesus Christ as my Savior. We stand in God's promise because we see the evidence that God keeps his promises. So, so within this third and last point, we need to be concerned people. We, that we have certainty of God's faithfulness. And we also see that there's universality of God's salvation. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not talking about the fallacious theology of universalism, all right? Here's what I mean. This old Jew was standing in the temple in Jerusalem... He saw off on a distant horizon. He said, my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people. It's a light of revelation to the Gentiles. So here's an old Jewish man who may have never even left the environment of Jerusalem his entire life. And he's standing face to face with a peasant couple, Joseph and Mary. They're holding an infant and looking at that infant and taking that infant into his own arms, he says, God is going to rescue humanity through this little baby. And he dared to say, he's going to be the central figure of the human race. He has been prepared in the sight of all peoples. And then in a moment of inspiration, he said he's going to be a light to the Gentiles. And guys, that's a big statement. You see, 33 years later, Jesus would look at Simon Peter and say, Peter, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. So how much more so this word that, that Simeon spoke, that Jesus didn't just come for 
the Jewish people. He didn't just come for the Gentile people. He came for all people. Jesus wants to save you today. No matter your socioeconomic background, no matter the color of your skin, no matter your nationality, Jesus came for you. Does that bless you? I hope that encourages you. That Jesus came here universally. He wants to reach everyone. Jesus didn't just come for certain people that he knew would eventually receive him. He came for all people. I hope that blesses you so much that if you don't know Christ, that today you can receive Christ. Because some of you in here today, you just think, man, I'm not good enough. I've done too much bad stuff. And I don't know if I could ever get saved. Listen. Jesus can save you today if you ask him for forgiveness. You say, I want to receive you as my Lord and Savior. You can be saved today. I want to encourage you to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior today. You say, well, how do I do that? You confess that you're a sinner, you believe in the Lord Jesus, and you can be saved. I want to encourage you that if you're not positive that you've ever received Christ, that you nail that down today. In a moment, I'm going to invite you to walk down one of these aisles, and you come up to the front, and you say, you know what, I need to receive Jesus Christ as my Savior. Others of you in here today, maybe you have received Christ, but you want to come forward and you want to pray that this Christmas would be one where you have a renewed focus of intensity and integrity and inspiration for the Lord. Maybe you're seeking direction from the Lord about something and you're, you've been encouraged by the life of Simeon that as Simeon was guided by the Holy Spirit to go to those temple steps, that you're asking the Lord to give you guidance today. So I want to encourage you, if you need to make a decision for Christ, that you'll do so today. Maybe you want to pray for a loved one, a family member, or a friend. Maybe they'll come to church this Christmas Eve and you want to pray for them. Maybe today's your first time in church in a long time or maybe ever. Maybe you're visiting family and you hadn't been to church in a while. And you want to come and just kneel down and pray before the Lord and just say, Lord, you know, I've been distant from you, but I want to come back home to you. I encourage you to come down, kneel down at this altar and you pray. If you want to pray with someone or have someone pray over you, you come forward and you come up to that person and you just say, would you pray with me? We'd be more than happy to do so. So if you want to receive Christ, you come. If you want to come forward and pray, you come. Maybe you want to feel, uh, maybe you want to uh, enter into the time of praying about joining our church family. And uh, ultimately, you have to go through a discovering church membership class and, and really learn about our theology and what it means to be a member of the church. But you can begin by walking forward and starting to pray about that process, about possibly joining Thomasville Road Baptist Church. So I invite you to come. Lastly, if you want to pray about any specific thing going on in your life or your family's life, and there might be uh, some area of needed prayer as you approach Wednesday, and you need to pray, and I encourage you to come forward and lay that before the altar of God. So would you stand up with me right now very quietly and very reverently? Bow your head and close your eyes. And as you bow that head and as you close those eyes, you come forward. I'm going to pray, and as soon as I end the prayer, you walk forward, you make a decision for Christ. Lord Jesus, we pray if anyone in here today needs to make a decision for you, that they would come. Draw them forth, Lord. Anybody who needs to receive Christ, anybody who needs to come forward to pray, anyone who wants to lift up a family member or a friend this Christmas season, God, we pray they would come. God, we pray that those who have lost family members or friends with whom they'll spend time this week, that they'll walk forward just to pray for their salvation. We pray for those in here today who have been very distant from you and they've come to church this week of Christmas, uh, maybe out of religious habit, maybe because they're visiting family. And Lord, maybe they need to come forward and pray. We pray that you would draw them forth, have them come before you with humility. We pray for this in Jesus' name.